invite you to turn it with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. And I'm not getting back into 1 Samuel here in the series that I left off um, about a month and a half ago. If I was, then I will have been skipping about 11 chapter, or 19 chapters, I should say. Um, this is, this is um, I, I've begun this little um, mini series of sermons over the last four weeks um, that, that have kind of become a series. I didn't plan for them to become a series. I just was kind of preaching week to week on following the Lord out of times of darkness. Um, and, uh, and it's become a series. It's become a little mini series. And sometimes that's how it works. And it just seems like that kind of backwards way of operation is kind of my status quo. That's just kind of how things work for me. Um, and uh, my hope is that years later, or maybe months later, or maybe weeks later, maybe even today, I can tell people um, that if you're, if you're struggling, if you're going through a dark time, a hard time, I've got some messages that I, where, I, where I preached on this and, and dealt with these kind of things and talked about it, because the Bible is about suffering. It's about walking with God through suffering. And uh, we're going to look at one example here of David doing exactly that in 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 to 6. And let me read this to you out of New King James. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag, quite a name of a city, right? On the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. And then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. And now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved or embittered every man for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Now, sometimes our need is for physical strengthening. We've got a physical problem, perhaps we're low, we're weak, maybe we're confused or hurt. And sometimes we just need a little bit of rest. Sometimes we just need a nap. Sometimes we just need maybe to relax a little bit, binge watch something on Netflix, perhaps. Sometimes we just need to eat some food or something like that. You can see examples in Scripture of people going through these kinds of uh, remedies, not watching Netflix, of course, but, um, but, uh, but you can see people uh, taking, a, taking a little rest, getting a little relaxation, eating some food, and getting strengthened. Sometimes that's what's needed. Other times our problem is intensely spiritual, and the only help that we can have is if the Lord himself comes and meets with us. If the Lord himself comes to strengthen us, give us spiritual strength, comforting us, soothing us, quieting our hearts, and strengthening us. Sometimes the line between physical and spiritual is hard to see. I think that it kind of gets blurry because we don't really know ourselves very well. We can live our lives and get up to 80, 85 years old and still say, I don't understand myself. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death, the Apostle Paul says. We don't really know what's going on in our hearts, and I think that Satan seizes on the confusion often. So we'll think that we have a spiritual problem, it's a physical problem, we'll think we have a physical problem, it's a spiritual problem, so on and so forth. The problem is that we're, we're complex creatures, our hearts deceive us, sin deceives us as well, and yet we know that God is a God who is acquainted with all of our ways. Psalm 139, David talks about before a word is on my tongue, you, O Lord, what? Know it all together. You know my coming out, my, my, my going out, my coming in, all of that. I don't under, understand myself, but you know me, Lord, better than I ever possibly could or anybody else possibly could as well. And so the point is that whatever our need is, he knows how to meet us, he knows how to soothe us, quiet our hearts, Sometimes he doesn't do it quickly because we need fatherly discipline, fatherly chastening from him. Sometimes he does do it quickly. Whatever he chooses to do, Scripture promises, Psalm 145, that his mercy is over all of his works. So whatever God decides to do, he's doing it with us mercifully. Now David here 
needs spiritual strengthening when you look at this situation. And God knows how to meet him, and indeed that's exactly what he does. Let's look a little bit at the backstory here so you can kind of understand what's going on in the text that we just read. David has been a man on the run for a long time. He's been a, he's been a man on the run. Um, he's been hunted by jealous and self-conscious King Saul for a long time. Saul knows that David is, is going to be the king eventually, and Saul has a lot of personal problems. Um, and men have even followed David as he's been on the run and living in caves with a, a type of loyalty that's similar to uh, Maximus's army's loyalty in the movie Gladiator, if you've ever seen it. 400 men go after David when he's on the run back in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel because they, they follow him. They trust him and they don't trust King Saul. And David has even partnered for a short time here with the Philistines, who are the enemies of the people of God, as a means of self-preservation, staying with them no less than 16 months. It's very interesting how, how this story is kind of shaping up. He's been fighting the Philistines. He slayed the tallest Philistine of all time, probably. And yet here he is partnering with them, living in one of their cities for a time while King Saul hunts him. Isn't it just interesting, the kind of contours and changes that life takes. We, we thought things were going to go a certain way, and then five years later, it's like I'm doing something I had no idea I was going to be doing. That's what's happening here with David. Now, in chapter 27 of 1 Samuel, the city of Ziklag is given to him by Achish, or Achish. Sounds more like I'm sneezing than saying a name, I know. Um, it's given to him by Achish, uh, the king of the Philistines, and it becomes sort of a headquarters for David and his army. David is really getting a lot of latitude here among the Philistines. But he's a good ally of the Philistines. He raids opposing enemy cities. He even destroys some of these cities. He really is a good ally of the Philistines. And back in chapter 27, he had hunted down and, and uh, raided the, one of the Amalekite cities. And so that gives us backdrop for what happens here in chapter 30. The Amalekites retaliate and come to David's new headquarters city where his family lives. And while he is gone away from Ziklag, probably with all of his men, the Amalekites retaliate, burn the city, and take away David's family. And not only David's family, but also the families of all of the men who were there as well. Now, this is a terrible situation, isn't it? Can you imagine coming home from work and the house is burnt down? And there's only a note saying, we've got your family, they're alive, but we've got them. I mean, sorry for the morbid picture, but, you know, but that's what's happening right here. This kind of stuff is happening in scripture all the time. The Bible is not PG rated, in case you, in case you, you weren't aware. Um, it's, it's, it's very much not so. It's, there are a lot of intense situations. That's what's happening here. David comes home, and the city's burned, his house is gone, his family is gone as well. We want to look at four ways that David and his men respond to the situation. There are four ways. The first two are responses from both David and his men. The, the second two are uh, ways that they differ in responding. The first way they respond is in verse 4, by weeping. They lifted up their voices and they wept. Just notice this. This is not a quiet, gentle sobbing that's happening here. They lift up their voices and they weep. They cry out to God audibly, loudly, yelling even. You ever done this? You ever cried this way before? Um, cried out to the Lord quite literally like that? It can feel maybe a little bit awkward for us because we tend to be sophisticated and, uh, and sort of quiet, spirited um, American Christians. What if I was to do that at the beginning of a sermon or something, just lift up my voice and just cry out to the Lord here? You would probably feel uncomfortable because we're just not used to people praying like that or ourselves praying like that. And it wasn't awkward for the biblical characters, though, to cry like that. They lifted up their voices oftentimes to cry out to the Lord. In fact, Proverbs 2, one of my favorite little sections of Scripture, I say that about all kinds of sections of Scripture, I know. It says that if you lift up your voice and call out for wisdom, you will understand the fear of the Lord. So not only do we find people in the Bible yelling out to the Lord and even weeping bitterly and loudly, we find the Bible prescribing us to call out to the Lord loudly, audibly, not quietly. People of God, they lifted their voices all the time. Sometimes the situation calls for exactly that kind of response. And I'm sure many of us have been in that kind of situation before. What's the second way that they respond? Continued weeping. Continued weeping. You say, 
Pastor, it sounds like you're just trying to fill out your, your sermon notes here because uh, this isn't a very deep point here. But, but look there in verse 4. It says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. Crying even until they're numb, basically, is what it's saying. Here's the thing. It isn't that godly men have to be criers. Um, some godly men just don't have that disposition. They're just not going to be crying very much, and that's fine. Uh, but when you look in the scriptures, you do find godly men crying a lot, actually. Jesus himself was a man of sorrows. Uh, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. The psalmist in Psalm 42 talks about his tears being his food night and day. Thankfully, I don't think it's literal. He's not literally drinking his tears night and day because that'd be gross. Uh, but the point is that all day long with whatever he's going through, there's just this, this weeping and this darkness that he's in. Godly men can cry. That's okay, right? And that's what's happening right here. They're just weeping and they're, they're crying bitterly until they're in a place of numbness. But then the third response shows a divide between David and his men. And the third response is that David's men have rage. Look in verse 6. It says that the people speak of stoning him, having bitterness of soul because their families had been taken captive. That is to say that they see quite clearly that this is a retaliation from the Amalekites because of something that David did. Notice these are the same men from chapter 22 who, because they were discontented with King Saul and they wanted good leadership by the one who's going to be the king eventually, they came and sought King David even if it meant that they would be hunted with him. But now they're talking about stoning King David. My, how quickly our opinions change of people and how, how quickly we, our moods change and all these kinds of things. Views of once loved people change and people especially turn on the anointed of the Lord. In one moment, Peter is saying, Lord, I am never going to let you go to the cross. And in the next minute, he's telling a little 12-year-old girl at a campfire that he doesn't even know who that man is, right? How quickly our moods can change. And they are filled with rage. They, they're it's part of their grieving process. You know that this happens when you're going through a grieving process. And they're even thinking about stoning David. And this leads to the fourth response, and that's David's response. And it's a response of distress leading him to the Lord. He's greatly distressed, it says. But look at what it says. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Hear me clearly today. Belief in God is not not having any anxieties or any anxious response to stress or pressure. Believing in God is not not having any anxieties or anxious response to pressure. The same Apostle Paul who said, be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4, also said that he, is, that he has a daily pressure of his anxiety for all the churches, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. Well, come on, Paul, which one is it? Be anxious for nothing, or do you have anxiety for the local churches? Paul would say the answer is yes, right? As often it is in the scriptures. You would say, well, Paul, Jesus is Lord. What are you so worried about? This, is this just another example of a Christian being a hypocrite, saying to live a certain way, but then not actually living that way themselves? Now, the, point, see, the point is this. Don't be surprised if your body, which is dead because of sin, Romans 8, 9, has that kind of anxious response again when stress and pressure starts to build up where you just don't know how to respond other than to be fearful and full, and full of anxiousness. Sometimes it just happens. You might even struggle with it as well. It might be kind of a, a chronic problem, something that you're constantly always dealing with. A believer is not somebody who doesn't have that response. A believer is a person who takes that response and makes a beeline to Jesus takes it to him and casts their anxieties on him. Because why, Peter says, cast your anxieties on him because why? He cares for you. So it's not that they don't have any, it's not that they don't have any stresses or struggle with those things. It's that they know how to take them and they know how to run to the Lord. And by the way, if they have maybe like a chronic problem of worry, fear, anxiety, they continue to just run to the Lord, continue to take it to the Lord until their thinking has changed. And over the course of time, he promises to shepherd them and lead them out of it. That is what David is doing right here. You can imagine being in his situation. His family's gone. The king, King Saul is hunting him. Now his men are turning on him, wanting to stone him. He doesn't have anywhere that he can go. 
And what's he doing? He's taking the pressure, the angst, the fear, and he's making a beeline to the Lord. And what does it do? It tells us in verse 6, it strengthens him, it encourages him, quiets his heart, and he finds comfort. Now, I want to think about this. We want to think about how did he strengthen himself in the Lord as God. We've already talked about it, making a beeline to Christ, but what does that look like? How did he strengthen himself in the Lord, and therefore, following his example, how can we do the same thing? How did David strengthen himself in the Lord, and how can we do the same thing? That's what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes, and I want to give you four ways. The first way seems obvious, but it's not. And by the way, before I make this first point, we're going to be consulting the Psalms because the Psalms are constantly showing us exactly how David um, strengthened himself in the Lord, because David wrote so many of the Psalms. So that shows us kind of what's going on in his heart as he's writing these songs down. So we're gonna consult the Psalms in each of these points. And the first point, like I said, seems very obvious. How did David strengthen himself in the Lord? The first point is this, by coming to God. Not a deep point, I know. But you'll see that at the beginning of Psalm 63. Psalm 63, he says, earnestly I seek you, my soul, Lord, thirsts for peace, comfort, resolution. My soul thirsts for you, is what he says to God. And Lord, if I get you, if I can get fellowship with you, if I can get you into my life and into my heart and into my mind, all those other things will take care of themselves. That's what David's saying in that psalm there. It might sound obvious to come to God, but I don't think it is. That instead of letting the floodwaters of the stress and the pressure overtake our soul, we come to the Lord, we lift up our voice, cry out, ask for wisdom, and like David said in Psalm 37, 5, commit our way to the Lord and trust in Him, and He will act. It sounds good, but it's not obvious, and here's why. Sometimes we can think that we're seeking the Lord, but we're actually not. What does the prophet Isaiah say in Isaiah 29, 13? These people honor me with their lips, but, somebody finish it. Their hearts are far from me. That's exactly right. These people, they might be honoring me with their lips, but they're not actually seeking me. They actually don't want me. This is all just a show. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 6, 7, when he speaks about those who heap up empty phrases to God, thinking that they will be heard because of their many words. What would God rather have? A heart that really is pursuing him and really wants him and his will. You can do a God word act in a non-God word way. You can have God word activity in a way that is not really truly God word. And so that's why I say you have to go to God first because you can think that you're doing it, but you're actually not. How do we go to God? We have to first get into our mind that God is there. Again, it sounds obvious, but when we're in our moments of stress, pressure, fear, whatever it is, let's be honest, we're struggling with believing that God is there. Excuse me. And let's be honest, that's our constant struggle all the time, believing that he's there. I I, I don't want a show of hands here, Um, but how many people, please don't put your hands up, Um, how, how many people here struggle with doubts in their faith, right? I mean, we've all been there. I think we all have. If you've not, wonderful. You should be pastoring. (laughs) Not me. We've all been there. We've all struggled. We've all had these doubts. And that's part of the struggle is because the scripture tells us not to doubt, but to trust the Lord. And yet we struggle with these things. I think that the Lord lets that continue so that we will lean on his grace to lead us out and to help us to have more confidence. But we've all been there. First, we have to get into our minds that God is there. Not only that he's there, but if you belong to Jesus, he's your father. He's not just the ruler in the sky who is watching your every move. He's your father. And he cares about you deeply and loves you, loves especially when you seek after him and pursue him. Most of you know, I have two little kids, and, uh, and my son Isaiah is a daddy's boy. My daughter Dorothy May, Isaiah's three, Dorothy May is a year and a half, and uh, Dorothy May is a, is a mama's girl. So Isaiah is a daddy's boy, Dorothy May is a mama's girl. Most of the time, Dorothy doesn't want anything to do with me. Let's just, let's just be honest, she doesn't really care about me too much. Um, I'll, say, I'll say, come here, and she won't do it. 
I'll make the tickle fingers and then she'll come to me. I have to kind of, have to kind of, uh, to kind of bribe her that way. There are times, there are times when I'll walk in the door and she'll want to see me. <laughs> and uh, she'll come up to me and here's what she'll do. She's just this little teeny wee thing. Um, she'll come up to me and she'll just stand six inches in front of me. And she knows that I know what that means. It means, Daddy, pick me up, right? How do you think it makes me feel when she does that? Do you think that it annoys me? Do you think that it's like, come on, honey, get out of my way. I want to go to the kid who actually likes me. I feel like, a mil- it's, I feel like whatever a million dollars feels like, I think, that's what, I think that's what I have in that moment. It's wonderful when the child who, frankly, a lot of the times doesn't want a whole lot to do with me, actually does want me, <laughs> actually does seek me. And if I'm a fallen dad, full of sin, and I'm that way, I know that instinctive kind of love for my child, how much more do you think the perfect Heavenly Father is that way when you truly seek after Him and truly pursue Him? Oh, He loves it. He wants you to crawl up into His lap. None of you are so mature and grown in your Christian faith that that illustration can't apply to you. You never become God's adult. You always have to be a child. The the kingdom of God is for such as these, Jesus says. We have to constantly view ourselves that way. And the promise is that when you seek him, he'll respond. He'll respond. One thing I want to say here before I move on to the second point here, it's this. When we come to God, it's not that we ignore our feelings. It's not that we ignore our feelings. Feelings can be a good thing. Just like we don't ignore Satan, like I said last week, but we have to stand and we have to fight Satan when he's tempting us and when he's, when he's pushing us, we have to stand and fight, whatever that looks like, we, you know, but we do have to stand and fight. So with our feelings, we don't ignore them, but we put them in their place. If you want to come to God, you say, regardless of how I feel right now, I'm coming to him anyway and I'm going to prioritize the Lord and his will, and I'm going to put my feelings under the Lord. That's when I just think that acknowledging the Lord before we acknowledge how we're feeling goes totally against not only the spirit of the age, but it goes against our very nature as well. But that's what it requires to come to the Lord first. The second thing, and the, the last three here are much shorter, I think, than the first point here. It's this. The second way that David comes to the Lord, or that David strengthens himself in the Lord as God, and that we can as well, is by remembering past deliverances. Remembering past deliverances. You can see that, for example, in Psalm 68. David is constantly just reciting past times when God has been there for the people of God and even for David himself. And indeed, reciting past deliverances and and kindness of God, that's something that we should be doing all the time. Actually, it's common in both Testaments for God to constantly remind his people of what he's done for them in the past. Tell my students in the classroom uh, up at the school, one of the things we looked at last semester was that before he gives the first commandment in the Ten Commandments, before he says anything, giving them a command, giving them what to do. First thing he says is, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Why does he start with that? I think you probably know. He starts with that because he wants them to see, I'm your father, I've delivered you, I've been there for you in the past, so when I give you my commands now, it's not that I'm just saying, live this way, or I'm gonna pour out you know, fire and brimstone on you. It's that you know I love you based on what I've done, and therefore, if you will commit to going my way, you should know that, it's, that my way is given to you for your good. I, I love you too much to bring you out here and then give you commands that are gonna lead you astray. And then Moses in his last sermon in Deuteronomy, especially in chapter 6, he tells the people of God, constantly remind yourselves of what God has done for you in the past and then teach it to your children as well. When they ask, why do we keep these commands? Say it's because God delivered us. He loves us and he's cared for us. You can see it in the New Testament as well. Why is Paul constantly in his letters saying things like, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord? Why does he say things like, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, but God, rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly places? Why does he say that? Is it just because Paul loves theology? 
He says it because he wants to remind them, God loves you and he's shown it to you in the past. He's taken you from where you were to where you are right now. And we need this kind of reminder. We need to constantly be remembering God's past deliverances because it's therapeutic to remember that whereas whatever this is that you're in right now, whatever David in Ziklag moment you're in right now, whatever it is, God was there for you in the past. He brought you out of that and he was there in a hard time in the past and he must be with you in the present as well. It's therapeutic to remember that. It must be there as well. Went through some of you, I mean, those of you in the church who are here regularly know, I've been going through a a hard personal time here recently. Um, A lot of things sort of mixed in with it, but there's been some kind of, been some kind of pastoral burnout uh, that's, that's been a part of it. And, um, and so there's, there's a mental sort of component to it as well. And I won't go into all the details, but recently I've just had to constantly be reminding myself when I went through something similar 10, 15 years ago, guess what? The Lord was there in the midst of that and there was, there was a shelf life to that struggle. What does that mean? There must be a shelf life to this one as well. And any struggle, any trial, any difficulty that we go through, it's the same thing. We have to look back on how he's been faithful in the past to remember that he will be in the present too. The third way that David um, strengthens himself in the Lord as God and that we can too is by acknowledging God's present blessings. Acknowledging his present blessings. So you see in the direction I'm going here. Remember past deliverances, acknowledge present blessings. Even in a moment of crying out in Psalm 30, David writes Psalm 30, he cries out to the Lord in verse eight of that Psalm. Yet if you look at it, he is constantly reciting all the ways that God is being good in the very present time. So, for instance, in this situation, in 1 Samuel, he could consider, well, okay, my family might be captive, but at least they're not dead, right? The city might be burned down, but it's not really my city anyway. My men might have turned on me and want to stone me, but maybe they're just grieving. So, so he, God's been kind to me. God is being kind to me even right now. The men will calm down. Things are going to be okay. Therapists talk about making gratitude lists. Maybe you've, uh, maybe you've heard of that before. And that's making a list where you're doing what the old hymn says, count your blessings, name them one by one. And I don't think that they, they encourage this just as a means of healing, as much as a means of bringing us back to the reality which we've forgotten. And what, what I mean by that is this. When we consider how is God being good to me right now, even in the present, The reason why that's therapeutic to us is because that's so not our default. Like we so easily focus on what we don't have and what we wish that we did, right? And so that's a recipe for discontentedness, for covetousness, and furthermore, what does the Apostle Paul say in Romans 1? It actually leads to insanity as well. When people don't acknowledge God or give him thanks, claiming to be wise, they become fools, their hearts are darkened, you read the rest of Romans 1 and you see what happens societally. Things fall apart, things go crazy, definitions are changed, people can't get along anymore. It leads to utter insanity, not just societally, but also individually as well. And so when the hymn says, count your blessings, name them one by one, it, should, it could be saying, for your own good, do this. It's not your default to look at how God has been good to you in the present, how he's being good to you in the present. So since it's not your default, go that direction. Zig while your mind wants you to zag and consider how God is being good presently. David did that and we should do the same thing. And finally, fourthly here, fourthly, the the fourth way that David strengthens himself in the Lord his God and that we can too is by foreshadowing future grace. Foreshadowing future grace. You see example of this in Psalm 42, one of my favorite Psalms. I love that psalm. It's not written by David, but you better believe, since it's written by the sons of Korah, meaning that it's probably really, really old, earlier than David, you better believe he was singing this hymn. If you read that psalm, one of the statements that they make in Psalm 42 is, why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God, soon you will rejoice again. That is to say, this is temporary. Whatever this chapter is, this is temporary. It won't last forever. 
Or if you like, as David says elsewhere in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes when? In the morning. Now, it's not literal when he says, I don't think it's literal when he says that in the morning. Some of us with our moods when we wake up in the morning, there's no such thing as joy in the morning, um, at least until the coffee gets into us, right? But the point is that whatever the dark night of the soul is that we're in right now, Sorrow might be in the midst of it, weeping might be in the midst of it, but there will be a morning when the sun will rise. And I have to cling to that and I have to believe that. So you preach to yourself like David did that this is temporary and that God will bring about restoration when it is time. One of you um, about a month, month and a half ago sent me a text message and and I'm not going to say who it was, but you know who you are. Sent me a text message saying, Pastor, imagine yourself on the other side of this. And that stuck with me, and I've thought about it a lot. It might sound like escapism, but it's not. Because oftentimes when you're going through some kind of very difficult trial that you don't really understand, the fear is that this is all that there is. And so to say, imagine yourself on the other side of this, is to do really exactly what the psalmist is doing here. Why are you downcast, O my soul? hope in God, you will rejoice again. You're going to come out of this in time. One of the most therapeutic things that scripture promises is that whatever this is, is only temporary in God's timeline. Not only has he been there in the past, but he's here in the present as well, and there is a morning that is coming. And so we cling to that. So you look at all of this, what David does. You look in the Psalms, how he strengthens himself. He comes to the Lord. He remembers the Lord's past deliverances, his present blessings. He considers, he foreshadows future grace. And all of this, in this dark moment that David is in, he is refusing to be beaten by it. He's not going to let it beat him. He refuses to let the enemy win. This is how he's fighting the enemy, right? I preached last week about Satan, uh, fighting Satan and all of that. This is how you do it, is by getting the word of God back into your heart, getting to the Lord, considering him who he is, and refusing to let the enemy win. Sometimes that kind of defensive posture against the situation is really all that you have. I'm hearing something. Somebody's, some music or something was just turned on. Somebody's phone. Um, Apparently the enemy doesn't want you to hear what I'm about to say to you right now. Um, Just kidding, there's nothing really too deep here. There it is again. But sometimes that kind of defensive posture of saying I'm refusing to, refusing to let this beat me is really all that you have. But if you have the Lord with you, ultimately it's all that you really need sometimes. The Lord just wants you to get into that posture. David in Psalm 28 verses six and seven writes this. God has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength. There's that word from 1 Samuel 30. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. I love this. And I am helped. What a beautiful little story. I wonder reading it. We don't have any evidence of this. But I wonder reading that psalm this morning if that psalm was written in this moment. I don't know. There's no proof of it. But it sure seems to fit well with where David is at. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. And what's happening is the stress and the pressure of the situation is standing in front of David barking at him like a rabid Rottweiler. And David is turning the word of God up to nine and saying, however scary this is, this is the truth, and this isn't stronger than the Lord. That's how he strengthens himself in the Lord his God. Eventually, that out yells the discouragement that David has, and that's how he's able to find strength. This is not a default position. Everything that I'm saying to you right now, you know how difficult it is to get into this mindset. It's not our default position. But I'm convinced that over the course of time, over the course of enough battles, of enough times where you don't know what to do just to run to the Lord, over the course of time, you can train yourself to make this your default position. You can train yourself to get to a place where whatever it is, I'm going to the Lord first and foremost. And he knows how to encourage us. He knows how to strengthen us. I took a class with a, a professor who's a, who's a pastor out in Colorado. And um, this, uh, this professor, pastor, he's, uh, he's known for being overwhelmingly positive, 
never confrontational, always encouraging, and uh, lighthearted and all of that. And uh, quite frankly, sometimes, uh, sometimes as Baptists, um, our MO in other people's eyes is decidedly different. Sometimes, you know, we can be a little bit, a little bit confrontational, um, not always encouraging, all of that. But, uh, but this, uh, this pastor, professor, he was asked once by uh, one of his parishioners, one of his churchgoers, why are you so positive, positive and why do you never, you never confront anybody about anything? I mean, like, e- even your, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly everything he said, but even your confrontations are done graciously. Why are you like this? The professor uh, said something to the effect of, because the Bible is a comedy. In the end, the good guy wins. You read the Bible, there's joy all throughout it. There's plenty of cause for rejoicing. God sits in the heavens and laughs at people making fools of themselves. We're told to rejoice all the time in the Lord. And then in the end, guess what happens? The good guy wins. Why stay negative? Why stay downcast? Why stay in the darkness? It's not don't ever go there. James 4 says, turn your laughing to mourning. Sometimes it's a good thing to do to get serious about the things of life. Jesus himself was a man of sorrows, wasn't he? But make a beeline to the Lord, and the Lord is going to strengthen you. And what you're going to find as you make a beeline to him and run to him is that over the course of time, he turns the weakness into a strength, and he turns the sadness into a joy. It's not that he removes whatever it was that was difficult. It's that he has an ability, as only he can, to redeem it and use it for good. And it makes you laugh at how good the Lord is. That's why, that's why the pastor was that way. He reminds you, God does, that he's in control. This is going to turn out well for you as well. Now, I'm not going to look at the rest of 1 Samuel 30, but just so you know, just as a a bit of a kind of a flyover of what happens, God answers David's prayer. Uh, God gives him direction through a prophet. They get their families back. All the people do, David and his men do. David eventually becomes the king, and things work out well. Of course, until you get to 2 Samuel and Things get bad with the whole Bathsheba thing, and then the family, you know, it turns into a, uh, turns into a Netflix drama. I don't know why I'm talking about Netflix so much. I don't even like Netflix. Um, but it, it turns into a drama after that. But regardless, things go well only after David runs to the Lord in the midst of his, his hour of darkness. Speaking of future grace, mentioned future grace a few minutes ago. Speaking of that, the New Testament writers are very clear that David knew that the Christ was coming from his line. And I think it's very clear of that, that Christ was coming from David's lineage. Um, So that being said, last Psalm I'm gonna cite here this morning. Notice what David does in Psalm 110 when he says in the verse that is quoted more than any other Old Testament verse in the New Testament. Psalm 110 verse one, he says, the Lord, capital letters, the Lord says to my Lord, lowercase letters, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemy your footstool. Notice something. There are two lords, but they're both called Lord. So there's distinction, but there's identification as well. Now Jesus, when he cites that later in the New Testament, Matthew 22, he says that the fact that David calls him Lord means that David recognizes Jesus for who he is. And what that means is that when David approaches God for strength, he knows that he's approaching a Trinitarian God who is relational in his nature and is himself love. Hence the steadfast love of the Lord that is appearing all over all of David's psalms. In other words, he strengthens himself knowing that that his father's default position is love and peaceful relationship. And surely that's what's going on right now too, David would say. Maybe the best way to see this love and peaceful relationship on display is to look at what Christ was going to do one day when he came into the world. In his great hour of need, in his great hour of darkness, what did he do? First, he prayed for his disciples because he loved them, loved us. And secondly, he kept them on his mind all the way to the point of death. You know why I can say that? Because scripture says that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What's the end? When the work was finished at the cross. That is to say that he had had us on his heart every step of the way until the end. And yes, he became sin when he was hanging on the cross, of course. He became a sin offering, but he did it because he loved us. 
He cared for us, and he had us on his heart all the way to the end. Didn't forget us, finished the work so that it would be the case and that we would know that it's the case, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Romans 8 promises that. Romans 9, what's it about? The sovereignty of God. What's the point? Why can nothing separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Because there's nothing that's stronger than the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say, what about the wrath of God, the anger of God over sin? Is that stronger? No. The wrath of God and anger of God over sin is a response to sin. But the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord is his natural disposition as a loving father. And furthermore, if we ever sin in such a way that he gets angry with us, he's already punished our sin on Christ because Jesus wanted to do that for us. Again, why? Because he loved us. And I'm saying all of this to you today because I want you to strengthen your hearts in the love of Jesus today. One last thing here. This situation, Ziklag gets burnt down, families are taken away. To some degree, it was David's fault. He was the one who raided the Amalekites in the first place. And yet he knows that he can still run to God. Everybody else has betrayed him. Nobody else is there for him. But he runs to the Lord. You should know too. Whatever you've got on your record whatever your rap sheet might look like, however you've sinned, or however messed up things are in your mind, heart, life, whatever it is right now, not only can you still run to God, but all of those problems are the very thing that qualify you to come to Jesus. Why? Because he didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners. He didn't come for those who are well. He came for those who were sick. I don't know about you, but I qualify. That's me. The question is if you will come with me to run to Jesus as well. So let's pray. So Lord Jesus, today, we are simply thankful that you are simply gracious, merciful, and compassionate. We see your compassion on display not only in the Gospels, which we, which we do all over the place, but we see it all throughout the Scriptures that you are so compassionate and merciful. And when we've made a mess of things, you say, run to me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. And indeed, the message of the Scriptures that Jesus Christ comes into the mess to redeem it shows us your accessibility. Lord, I pray that today, whatever's going on in our heart of hearts, that we would run to you who came to us and promises that if we draw near to you, indeed you will draw near to us. And we pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. If you have a hymn book, which I will shortly...